Hey, folks, thank you so much. That was an awesome intro. I love your style, dude. All right, so... So yeah, this title is titled, uh, or this talk is titled Duality, Advanced Red Team Persistence Through Self-Reinfecting DLL Backdoors for Unyielding Control. There's a lot of words there, I know. Uh, and I hope they all make sense in the end, because I still don't know what they mean. Uh, but maybe we'll both figure it out here in a bit. So uh, a little bit about me. Again, my name is Faisal Tamish, Technical Director. I uh, spend half my time doing uh, security research to support our uh, red team ops uh, at Aon and basically it's kind of like a consultancy within Aon that does you know pen testing and red teaming and I do the research to kind of make our red teams shine a little more and be have a higher chance of being successful. I have a couple of certs and uh, in my spare time I love training jujitsu and Muay Thai. Does anybody here do jujitsu? Uh, all right. All right. Just InfoSec has some folks, you know, so I got to ask. I also love to hunt, uh, and I love playing guitar and producing music. Uh, you can actually find some of my music on Spotify under Primal Cerebral. So there's my uh, little music thing. Anyway, let's start out with a little war story. I want you guys to imagine with me that you are on a red team, and uh, you've obtained a foothold through a physical vector, and that is one of your very talented colleagues. She is absolutely amazing at obtaining access to wherever she wants, really. Uh, she can talk herself into anywhere. And uh, to do that, we've targeted an office building, kind of like in a downtown area. We're going to uh, try to, you know, the way those buildings work is the first floor has a turnstiles where you would use something like a badge. You'd get through the turnstiles, and then you uh, get into the elevator, and then maybe you'd have to use your badge there, and eventually you get to the floor, and sometimes you have to badge into different places depending on their security. Now, if you guys heard me say the word badge multiple times, that was very intentional, so we really need to use a badge cloner, and that's something that we use heavily during these types of engagements uh, in order to get somewhere. So uh, she's able to clone somebody's badge just by talking to them and having her tote back, you know, within one or two feet of that person. Usually those folks have their badges, you know, on their belt or something like that. Kind of an easy clone. And then um, from there, when she gets to the floor between a couple of workstations uh, and network ports, uh, she's able to get a couple of footholds and so far they're entirely undetected. She's able to egress herself out of the building, so no physical detections and plugging things into the network port, uh, the way that it works and the way we have our hardware set up, it's pretty hard to detect. Um, and also, uh, there is an, uh, an unlocked workstation, so we were able to drop a form of initial access. Cobalt strike. So, uh, now it's your turn to play. You're the cyber operator uh, behind this red team, kind of supporting it from the back, and you have an objective. Your objective is to compromise the CEO's machine stealthily for long-term information collection. You're looking for information that might inform the company's financial direction for basically insider trading. And this is absolutely illegal, don't do that. But I'm just saying this is what your objective is and we're trying to simulate getting to that point and being able to collect that kind of information. We're gonna need to persist on that machine for extended durations. So we can't do the thing where you have internal network access and you just um, you know, use whatever WMI exec or PS exec or your custom variant of those to gain code execution on the machine. We actually want to be on the machine in case that person's not connected to the VPN. And let's say they're traveling, they're not connected, we still want that continuous persistence on that person's machine. The laptop is equipped with a AV and EDR solution that will detect common implant loading persistence uh, loading and persistence techniques, so things like registry keys, auto start directories, schedule, scheduled tasks. It turns out that for that specific user is an active directory group that is very heavily monitored for common persistence techniques. Okay, the SOC is pretty locked in on LALBAS, and for folks that haven't done uh, pen testing or red teaming, those are basically Windows binaries and scripts that you can use to indirectly execute some code to load an implant. MS build is one example, run DLL is another, and there's uh, quite a few of them. Now, it turns out if a machine never runs one of those lol bass and then randomly it just runs one, that could be a heuristic for detection. The EDR itself, interestingly in this case, does not auto-quarantine novel portable executables on touching disk. 
And this is something that a lot of EDRs and AVs do out of the box. The moment you touch disk, uh, it's going to check the reputation of the binary, and it's going to try to make sure that, uh, you know, if it's signed by some kind of certificate, that the certificate is not blacklisted, et cetera. And sometimes they just run it through their sandbox, and it takes a while. So it really depends on the EDR. But that's really in the most aggressive settings, and sometimes you run into environments where that's kind of toned down, and you don't have that kind of immediate response. The EDR is going to detect syscalls from weird memory addresses. And again, um, syscalls are basically a way to bypass uh, how the EDR hooks one of the primary DLLs that's used for interacting with the operating systems, operating system, which is uh, ntdll.dll. And we basically need our tradecraft to be flexible in between ops or sometimes within the op itself, depending on what we're targeting. Signed backdoor DLLs will likely get deleted on program updates, and this is because, let's imagine the scenario, let's say we backdoor ffmpeg.dll for Microsoft Teams, which um, is a dependency. Uh, what happens when we, on the next Teams update? It's gone. You lose your backdoor. So if you backdoor one DLL, no matter how advanced it is, the next time Teams updates, which is in like a week or two, you lose your uh, persistence technique, and we want to persist for way longer than that. Okay, so let's define our problem statement. We want to execute from trusted memory space. Uh, we could do, and what, to do that, we're going to do some variant of side loading. There are quite a few uh, sub techniques for side loading. What vulnerability really allows us to do that? And this is the main takeaway of this talk. Uh, if you're really like, what, how can I put this into one sentence? Most programs don't check for dependency integrity. When they're loading in DLLs, they don't really care. You know, they lean a lot on the AV and EDR solutions to make sure that the DLLs that are going to be loaded or not are not malicious or malicious, and then the EDR is just going to delete that DLL or prevent the executable, the main executable, from actually executing. By the way, do I, am I loud on the speakers? I can't really hear myself out there. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, we want, since we're backdooring multiple DLLs, we want to plant custom shared logic between all the backdoors so they can do things like reinfect each other and they have this kind of smart hive behavior between them. Reinfecting each other ends up being one cool thing you can do, but you can actually end up doing quite a few things with that. The backdoors themselves, they have to execute and not disrupt the original program logic or memory stability. That means that if I load a DLL, even if I bring my implant up, I don't want the main program to crash. First of all, it's, it's not gonna be usable, so we need program continuity. And the second thing is we actually need to inject into a different process from that main one that's loading the DLL because loading DLLs, especially uh, if you interfere with a DLL main loading process, is very finicky in Windows. So there's a lot of things you have to work around, like if DLL main takes too long or if you allocate too much memory or if you do different things from the DLL main, uh, especially through your injected code, it's going to basically hang the program. Any operations on the victim host when we're staging these backdoor DLLs, either when we're grabbing them or putting them in, we, we need to make sure the stager doesn't do anything too crazy besides uploading, downloading files and copying, moving, or deleting. That's because staging and payload detonation for your implant, when they're too close together, is actually a heuristic for EDR. So if you have a stager that, let's say it's PowerShell, or let's say it's an HTA file that then runs some PowerShell, which then does like process injection or something like that, that itself, since it's so close to the staging process, is a heuristic and helps inform the EDR that something funky is going on. So separating the staging from the payload detonation as much as possible uh, gives us the ability to be stealthier. So we want the ability to use this for persistence, and it turns out we can use this for initial access as well. And I'm going to cover that here in just a little bit, even though the talk is kind of centered around the persistence idea. But once you understand the idea of duality and the methodology, you can do a lot with it. So let's look at some current options. Before I decided to come up with my own thing, I was like, okay, what's already out there? So the first option is uh, going to be the backdoor factory. The backdoor factory is uh, a kind of a popular piece of work, actually. It's very cool. Uh, there was a black hat talk about it. 
and there are some advantages to it. It supports different architectures, so you can backdoor Windows, Linux, Mac, whatever you like, and it operates at the assembly level, which is what we want, and I'm gonna to touch on why that's necessary. With some modifications, you probably could implement duality-like features, but the workflow does not include easy C to polymorphic assembly generation. Basically, the way the backdoor factory works is you have some folder, you put in your assembly code that you want to backdoor, to put into the DLLs that you're trying to backdoor. It just goes and grabs the assembly and puts it where it needs to go. And you don't really have too much control in the workflow of how that assembly is generated and what you can do after you compile the assembly. And I'm gonna to touch on, Duality does a lot with that. So repurposing the backdoor factory is possible, but it's probably gonna be more work than just designing something from scratch. With that said, the backdoor factory was a huge inspiration, so thank you to Josh Pitts, uh, also known as the Midnight Runner. So the second option here is DLL proxying. So theoretically, you can implant any logic you like via DLL proxies, and this is kind of a, a more of a modern uh, technique, actually, that's used by red teams these days. The logic itself is written at a higher level in assembly, something like C, and with some compiler and linker magic and helper scripts, you can end up uh, backdooring DLLs in a manner where it proxies certain function calls, executes malicious code, and hands it over to the original DLL like nothing happened. Now, DLL proxying is great, but keep in mind that beyond some EDR bypass jujitsu, we are really interested in highly polymorphic machine code because we wanna do things like control flow obfuscation, dead code insertion, instruction substitution, all that fun stuff to make our code really hard to reverse and really hard to signature, especially between different iterations. So like a payload generator, different iterations, makes it really hard to signature that piece of malware. Okay, so there is implicit power in assembly. This is kind of the typical workflow for uh, DLL proxying. You have a process, it loads a dependency, in this case it's math.dll, which exports a bunch of functions, so you can call add, subtract, and all that. But when you're DLL proxying, you actually, you, you call in this proxy DLL, and one of these functions is gonna be replaced with some malicious function. And then you can, when, when that function ends up getting called with the same name, it's going to basically execute the malicious code and then either terminate right there or hand it over to the, the function that's supposed to be called. So it's gonna proxy it on. Any other function that's called is immediately going to go to where it's supposed to go because we're not backdooring those functions. So note here that we have two DLLs on the system. We have the proxy and the original. Uh, and also, there are some limitations to proxy DLing that become more clear as we cover duality more in a bit. So without further ado, let me introduce actually duality. So this is a logo that I made in Illustrator in 30 minutes. Hope you guys like it. If Brian made a logo, he'd be able to do something much better than I. <laughs> but uh, this is what I could come up with. And those basically, those are the two um, icons or symbols for uh, DLLs. And the idea behind the logo is that the DLLs know of each other's presence in the operating system. They're checking for their infection state, and if they're no longer there, they're respawning the duel. So, and by the way, it's duality, like there's two, but actually it turns out you can use the same thing. You can backdoor like 10 or whatever, arbitrary number of DLLs, and they all check on each other. We'll touch more on that in a bit. So, there's really three major components to duality. There's the target machine interaction script, which is going to be, uh, in this case, like duality.cna, which is basically an aggressor script for uh, Cobalt's, uh, it's, a, it's a script. Aggressor script is the scripting language for Cobalt Strike, and you can use that in uh, ways to automate things that you want Cobalt Strike to do. So duality.cna is the persistent script that helps you use duality uh, as you're operating from within a Cobalt Strike context. This is with regards to persistence. You can also have a PowerShell one-liner, and this is actually going to be released, but the one-liner itself is going to be easily detectable by a more advanced EDR, and then you can actually implement your own custom stager. The PowerShell one-liner and the stager are for initial access, and uh, the PowerShell one-liner can still evade uh, any of the lower AVs and EDRs, but if you want to be able to evade the more advanced stuff, you probably want to write your own stager. We're, we're not going to release the more advanced stagers just because we try to keep our tradecraft at like N minus one. We try to share with the community, 
but at the same time, it takes a lot of time to do this research. Uh, so we try to keep like what we release at n minus one. And but you can take all that knowledge or all that uh, methodology and slightly modify it and improve it a little bit, and you can pretty much get to what we use uh, inside for our own red teams. The second component here is a C# -sharp program, which is going to actually do the backdooring once you upload the DLLs. It's going to perform the backdooring by relying on the shellcode C file that is pre-written. The shellcode C file is a program written in carefully written C. <laughs> and I'll touch on why that is. It's because you don't have the C runtime, basically. So you're, you're writing position-independent code. You're going to compile that down. Uh, the C Sharp program is going to compile that down and then inject it into the DLLs to backdoor them. And then the stager or the persistent script is going to grab those DLLs and slide them in where they need to go for the programs that uh, you're backdooring. Okay, so in general, what does duality do for just trying to rephrase it in a much simpler manner? It, bro it backdoors a set of dependency DLLs. Each DLL is aware of every other dual, and there's three modes of operation. Singularity is when you have only one DLL backdoored, and this is the case for initial access. You're probably gonna backdoor one DLL through your stager, slide it where it needs to be, potentially respawn the program that you want to load that DLL to immediately get your shell, or you're going to give it some time, and whenever the program gets naturally used, it's going to spawn the shell for you then. The second mode is duality, and duality is the minimum number of, uh, you need two DLLs, it's a minimum number of DLLs required to manifest the duality phenomenon where the DLLs check on each other. And the third one is totality, which is when you have more than two DLLs. So if you backdoor, say, 10 dependency DLLs on 10 different programs, then you're going to uh, be able to, you know, whenever any of those programs runs, it checks on the nine other DLLs, reinfects them if necessary, and also brings one implant up, not more than that. So you don't spam your C2 server. One other thing about singularity, too, is it happens if, total, uh, if duality fails. So, for example, if you have two, you're down to two DLLs, one of them dies, let's say because the program gets entirely deleted from the system. The other dual is no longer going to find the, you know, it, the, its dual, basically. One of the DLLs can't find its dual, so then it understands that now it's by itself, it's operating in singularity mode. Each DLL checks on all the other duals to reinfect them, we already said that. And then we're going to bring an implant up if it's not already up, and any of the backdoor DLLs can do that. So how does the whole chain work? Let's speak in more practical terms here. So let's say we have three programs we're trying to backdoor, Teams, Slack, and Python. We're going to grab a dependency from each of those programs, fmbag.dll, um, and actually for both programs, they have the same dependency name. And then we're going to have python 311dll And then we're also going to have uh, the ntdll.dll from the same machine. Because duality, the, the back end, can actually add a section of a clean NTDLL that is unhooked from the same host that the stager uploaded, and we're going to refer to that when we're doing things like process injection so we bypass all EDR hooks. For each DLL, we're going to use that C-sharp program. It's going to encrypt our C2 shellcode. That's all happening in the, in the back end, by the way, which is uh, basically a host controlled by the operator. We're going to pack clean NTDLL into a section with a random name, same thing with the C2 shellcode that's encrypted, and then we're going, to we're going to swap out template variables in the shellcode C file. What are the template variables? Well, each DLL needs to know where all the other DLLs are, so that's one example of template variable, it's just an array of strings, and then we're also going to tell it what are the names of the mutexes that are randomly generated during runtime uh, to bring an implant up or to check if the other DLLs are still infected. So there's two things that we're doing there. Uh, and there's a bunch of other things that you do with the template variables. Finally, the C-sharp program compiles the shellcode C file and injects it into the DLLs. So where's the duality in all of this? Um, the SCC file defines custom logic. Basically, prior to process injection, each backdoor DLL, it knows where all the other duals are that are dueled. It checks on each dual for this thing called the sign of the, sign of the dual. And what that essentially means is it's a little part in the DLL, and it can be anything, but in this case, it's a section name. And the other duals know that per DLL, there needs to be this specific section name in order to know that 
that dual will is still infected. If it's not there, we know that the DLL has been cleansed, so to speak, so we need to perform a reinfection. This, that special section name is basically something that only the backdoor DLLs know of each other. If you try to write a signature for that, and actually the first version of duality intentionally hard codes that section to a name of called dot duality, because I'm hoping that AV and EDR out there do end up signaturing that. But in the second blog post, and neither of them are out yet, going through legal takes a long time. <laughs> but uh, in the second blog post, uh, we're going to have tradecraft improvements. And one of those tradecraft improvements is all the section names are randomly generated per iteration of duality backdoor DLLs. So it makes it really difficult to signature specifically for that thing. And we already talked about if a new DLL is present because of a program update, it's not infected, we're going to reinfect it. This is kind of the logic. And I'm going to run through this because it's, it's a little dry, but I'm just going to try to point out some things that are interesting. So the DLL gets loaded. We're going to check for this keep alive mutex. Really, the key point here is DLLs get loaded and unloaded multiple times during a program lifecycle. We don't want to keep reinfecting stuff and bringing implants up every time a DLL is loaded. You're going to have like 100 shells back in your C2 servers, and you're going to DDoS yourself, and you're going to lose, and you lose the red team. So we're not going to do that. We're going to use a mutex. We're going to do that every, you know, once every time a program, any of the backdoor programs comes up. And then if, it, you know, if you shut down the program, restart it, we do that check again. But we're not going to do it every time a DLL gets loaded through the same program lifecycle. So we're going to backed up duals. We're going to check if they're still infected. And we're going to reinfect them otherwise. We're going to check for that implant mutex. Again, we're going to keep one implant up. If the implant has been brought up before and that mutex exists, which, by the way, uh, if you guys don't know what a mutex is, think about it as like uh, an operating system level flag. It's a, like a, a thing that you set in the kernel that you're like, hey, this mutex is there. You can use it for multiple things like running things in parallel, but you can also just use it as a flag. Uh, and so if that flag is up, we know that the implant's been brought up before, and so we're not going to bring it up again. Okay. And then at the end, after we do our shellcode-based process injection, and I say shellcode-based because that C program gets compiled down into shellcode, backdoored into the DLL, and now the DLL, when it runs, it has the shellcode to perform process injection. The shellcode itself for the C2 is another section in the DLL. So the pipeline. So we talked about the different components. In general, how's the pipeline working? Our aggressor script is grabbing the DLLs, or the web stager is going to grab DLLs. This is in the case of persistence or initial access. We're going to upload them to the back end. The back end is going to backdoor these, those DLLs with the SCC file, which is, contains all our logic and our process injection technique. And it's going to rely on that clean empty DLL section, which is present in each DLL. So when the malware runs, we know that uh, if we perform like syscalls or indirect syscalls, that we're not using any hooked version of NTDL unless it's necessary. So when I get to indirect syscalls, it turns out that using the syscall from the NTDL currently loaded in memory is very advantageous because when EDR does stack unwinding post a syscall, they can actually examine where that syscall is coming from. So sometimes you'll execute things with direct syscalls, but you'll still get caught. So there's ways around that. And th that becomes more pertinent when you're operating from the implant. Like if a syscall came from somewhere in the heap, because you're, you, you loaded your implant in memory, and you performed a syscall, and they did stack unwinding, it's like, why is there a syscall coming from the heap? That's almost 100% guarantee that something malicious is happening. So it's a high fidelity indicator. So with that, uh, the last thing is, after we download those backdoor DLLs, our stagers are just going to slide things where they need to go. OK, so let's look at what actually happens in memory uh, when, when this, is, this stuff is happening. So the first thing is, we're going to patch the entry point, although you can patch other you know, function entry points, basically. But we're just going to patch DLL main in this case. And all the arithmetic done by the duality engine, you can do that for any DLL. There's not really anything hard-coded in that sense. So you pass in any DLL, it knows to then find a code beach. What's a code beach? So you guys know code caves, right? That's pretty common. You have like uh, some space in the code, and between them you have two chunks of assembly. That's pretty handy, but there's something interesting that happens when you load a DLL from disk to memory. 
When Windows loads that DLL, when it puts the sections in memory, it's actually going to put them at a certain modulo away from each other. Let's say you load some section at address 0, and the length of that section is, I don't know, 981 bytes. It's not going to put the next section at 982. It's actually going to do it at a modulo of like 1,000 or 10,000 hex, something like that. So that space between the section, the sections I call a code beach, and the analogy there too is that memory isn't entirely allocated. So if you go too far in the code beach, some of that is allocated, but you're going to run into unallocated memory before the next section, and if you execute code there, your program is going to crash. But the nice thing about code beaches is usually there's a lot of space. So it's a nice place to put in your pre-shell code stub, and what that's doing is saving the register states, and then it's calculating the address to where the malicious duality section is so that it can jump to it. Now, if we look from a zoomed out perspective, we can see three sections here that have random names. In the first blog post, like I said earlier, the duality section is going to be called dot duality intentionally to be signatured. And then in the next blog post, we randomize the names of the sections between every iteration of backdoor DLLs. That way you can't just signature on the section. And then in the third iteration, we're going to expand the text section and cram all the code, the malicious code, in the text section and do all the wiring we need to make sure that it actually executes in the text section. So it looks like there's not even any added sections. The memory permissions for executable sections are already set when the DLL is there, so we're not doing any virtual protect during runtime. We're not changing permissions, which is something that could be detected by EDR. This is kind of what it looks like in the C-sharp program. So we use a library called PENet, and PENet is uh, a program that allows you to manipulate PEs, portable executables, so EXEs or DLLs. And I built on top of that so we can add and write to these sections during runtime on the fly. When we prepare the shellcode C file, when I said replace some template variables in there, Remember, we have the array of DLLs that we need to know about where all the other ones are. We need to know the decryption key for our shellcode, and we need to know things like uh, the, the mutex names that we're also generating on the fly. There's a few other things there, but we don't need to go through those. The SCC program, like I said before, is written mindful C. It performs process injection, but it's customizable by the operations ar architect. So you can use different forms of process injection, uh, and basically, you can have your tradecraft be flexible so it's not just set in stone when you create one assembly listing. You can recreate the assembly listing from that C file. So basically, you can write your process injection in C and then dynamically compile it to shellcode and then inject it. We can't use the C runtime, again, because we're writing position independent code. We can't guarantee that the C runtime is loaded. And we can't use string references. They have to be inlined. Because we're going to have our position independent code as just one chunk of shell code, we can't refer to something like an R data section or anything like that in the executable. So we need to make sure that the string reference are going to be in the same chunk of position independent code. And this actually gets converted into PIC using a program called Masm SAC by Hasherzad. Uh, she's an awesome uh, malware. Uh, she focuses in the field of malware and writes a bunch of tooling for that. And it ends up being that we can actually use that for duality to perform our position-independent code compilation. So to go from C to position-independent code. A really awesome project, and uh, thank you, Hasherzad, for that. The other thing the SCC program does is it dynamically resolves function pointers from the packed, clean, NTDLL section. So each DLL is going to dynamically figure out where that clean NTDLL section is in memory, and then it's going to look for the functions that we want to use, and then it's going to give you a pointer an address, hey, this is the function that you want. This is a clean version of the function that you want. You don't have to rely on the DLL currently in, sorry, on empty DLL currently in memory. For, let's say Teams loads FFmpeg. Teams also has empty DLL in memory. That empty DLL is hooked. But instead, Teams, when it loads your FFmpeg, malicious FFmpeg.dll, that's going to have a clean empty DLL section that your malware refers to to bypass EDR hooks. So why clean a TDL for folks that uh, don't uh, red team or write malware? The NTDL on Windows in every process, unless there are exceptions, is hooked. That means 
when you call NTDLL, all it's doing is setting up a syscall identifier and then performing the syscall. But prior to that, the stack is getting set up with a bunch of arguments. So if you place a jump statement at the beginning of that function call the, in the NTDLL and jump to an EDR uh, DLL, the, the EDR can then examine the stack and see what, like if you call create remote thread and you have things in the stack, which is where you pass your arguments, uh, or R8, R9, depending on which uh, architecture you're using, fast call, et cetera. It can examine the registers and the stack and say, hey, are we going to do something malicious that's connected to something previously done? Like if we do a, a virtual alloc and a remote process and then eventually do a create remote thread, that's going to be a clear indicator that something weird is happening. And some folks try to unhook on the fly. They're like, I'm gonna remove hooks and stuff, but EDR actually checks to see if the hooks are still present sometimes, especially within short time frames of spawning a new process. So what I like to do is just grab a clean version of NTDLL and pack it. Since we have the ability to do that, we never have to worry about that. So we're just gonna pack our way out of it. Now, I don't, I don't really expect you guys to be able to read this, I'm sorry, this is, but the point here is that there are these, this is the carefully written C file, and there are these functions that start with an underscore. Those were resolved by another function that enables you to just call a function like this and end up getting the equivalent of an indirect syscall from the duality context. And so you don't have to, the function that does that for you is already there. You don't have to go out of your way to think about how do indirect syscalls work. But we're just gonna do a quick crash course on indirect syscalls in case you weren't aware of how they work. Essentially, let's say you're trying to interact with the operating system, you're trying to get a handle on something. Let's say it's a mutex. Eventually, uh, in NTDLL, the sync for all the calls, you're gonna go through kernel 32, kernel base, you're gonna end up in NTDLL, and NTDLL is gonna have this function called ntopen. All the stack and stuff is set up before you get there, in terms of what, what do you wanna, what do you open a handle to, et cetera. But NT, ntopen and NTDLL is setting up a syscall identifier and calling syscall. It's really two things, it's not that hard. Syscall sound fancy, but all it's doing is just doing that. Now, what is a syscall? Right, so we're operating in user mode. This is where we can do all of our, hey, I, I request something from the kernel. When I perform a syscall, I hand execution over to the kernel, which has access to other things that user mode doesn't have access to, okay? So when you do a direct syscall, it means you're grabbing that assembly stub of instructions, the op codes, to set up the uh, register with the correct syscall identifier and perform the syscall, but Performing an indirect sys, sorry, the issue with that is if, let's say you perform a direct syscall and the EDR can examine your stack after the syscall. Okay, so this is going to be the same issue that we had when EDR just hooked into DLL. We thought that if we bypass that hook and just got to the syscall, we can no longer worry about that. But indirect syscalls allow you to jump Instead of having that syscall and the direct syscall, we're going to jump to the actual NTDLL's syscall in memory. That means when the EDR unwinds the stack, it says, where's that syscall coming from? It's coming from the legit location, the actual NTDLL loaded in like teams.exe, which has the hook there. But instead of going through the hook, we're just going through the syscall. And this is basically the code that does it. And um, there's one function there called create jump om code. And the reason I'm showing that is because, well, you'll see in the next slide actually, we have to redefine things like the C runtime function. So we can't just use memcopy. We have to define our own memcopy because that's something that's available typically in C, but we can't use that in position independent code. So we, define, we redefine parts of the C runtime so that we can use them in our position independent code. Now, see how up here we have this is what it's gonna look like if you call something like ntopen. We're gonna load some syscall identifier into our register, and then we're eventually gonna call it syscall. And it's gonna be based on this identifier, like 3F is associated with ntopen, for example. When we do indirect syscalls, we're going to replace that last syscall with a jump. That jump is going to be into the actual ntdll of the current process. This is, the ad, this is what we're loading into R14, and we're gonna jump to that address, 
And guess what that address is? That address is the syscall in NTDLL. So that's an indirect syscall. That way, when the EDR post syscall examines your stack, it's like, where, is, where are things coming from? Well, they're coming from the actual uh, NTDLL in memory. So that's how you bypass. That's the first step to bypassing post. It, it, we're kind of living in the post syscall era as malware developers and red teamers. And there's even more advanced techniques like stack spoofing and stack dispersion, which is what the brute Rattel guy is doing, which basically you call like a win API. It creates an entirely new thread with its, its own stack. And that new stack is dispersed from the original one where the malware is running. So when they do stack unwinding, they can't actually see the, uh, the malicious stuff that you're doing in the previous stack. So I call that stack dispersion. I don't, I don't really think he gave it a name. <laughs> so when we compile this stuff in the C-sharp program, again, that's kind of our pipeline. I'm just going to go, this, this looks like a lot. Let's look at the first, this commented out thing. This is really the whole command that we're running. We're going to run CL. We're not going to do stack canaries, or, and we're going we're gonna to create the full assembly, and we're just going to compile it. We're not going to try to link it. And then we're going to run it through MASM SHC, which is going to create our position independent code. And then we're also, after we do that, intermediate, in the intermediate process, we're going to replace some things in the assembly listing such that it actually compiles down into position independent code. Because this is only necessary if you're going to end up if you're going to end up linking, like the short and offset flat things. This is kind of in, in how the PEs are laid out in memory. Not really relevant to what we need for the PIC, so we're going to take those out. When we link it, we're not really linking against anything. We're just creating an executable at the end. And the dot text section of that executable is going to be your position independent code, which is what we do in the next slide when we extract it. At the end, we extract the dot text section which ends up being our position independent code. We trim some zeros there because it ends up being a lot of trailing zeros we don't need for our PIC. Now we have our position independent code. What about code signing? Some AV and EDR will detect on side loading unsigned binaries. Well, uh, code signing is something that's going to be added. It's in the works. Uh, I'm not going to go through how you can obtain a signing certificate, but if you're, resor if you're resourceful and you look, you don't even have to look too hard. Uh, you're going to find a lot of stuff, even including the password, not just the cert, you know? So very, very handy. Um, it's easy to implement in the C-sharp pipeline. After you backdoor the DLL, you sign it, you have a little bit more trust from the EDRs. And this is basically how it would work. It's just a command line that you run with a certificate and the password. In this case, we're signing a .exe, but you can really sign whatever you want, uh, any portable executable including DLLs. So what about initial access? We, used all about the, we talked about all this maybe slightly complex stuff with uh, persistence and compiling shell code. Can we use any of that for initial access? Because this is kind of a powerful pipeline. And the answer is yes. We can reuse the same pipeline, but we're going to need to use some smart stager. This is kind of the stage zero. There's kind of a trend happening in the Red Team community right now where they use these smart stagers. It's not just running like a PowerShell one-liner. They're a bit more discreet, and they're giving you information about the information, information about the environment so that you can uh, do some smarter stuff with your payloads. So the stager is going to enumerate low privileged DLLs. That means they're in locations where the current user can easily access. And for things like Teams and Slack, they end up dropping them in app data. And you can just grab those DLLs as you like and backdoor them. It's going to upload and download DLLs. It's going to swap out files where they need to go. And it's going to force restart programs if you want an instant shell. If there are no DLLs to backdoor, it can run a short-lived run DLL32 process. If you backdoor the right place in a DLL, such as DLL main, when you run, run DLL32, it turns out that it actually runs DLL main momentarily. You can point it to a function that doesn't even exist in the DLL. It'll be like, can't find that entry point for that function. But I executed DLL main for you, and you have your shell now, so cool. We'll just use run DL32. Offset considerations depending on the environment. Most of the time, if you run short-lived run DL32 processes, you're probably going to be fine if that tradecraft that's being run in that DLL is actually uh, clean and bypasses EDR hooks, et cetera, doesn't spawn processes and allow the EDR to do like parent-child uh, correlations, heuristics, et cetera. 
Um, and the last thing here is loader agnostic, but the demo uses PowerShell. So there is a demo. I say loader agnostic, that means you can code it in whatever you want. You want to write it VB script, go ahead. But PowerShell is going to be kind of easy to demonstrate. So PowerShell isn't PowerShell dead. What about OPSEC? Well, actually, no, it's not. Uh, but there's a lot more tripwires. Uh, you know, PowerShell script lock logging, you have AMC, you have ETW, and you have EDRs hooking specific things in PowerShell to get even more telemetry out of it. So it's kind of like walking through a minefield. Would you want to do it? Probably not, but can you? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you can. Actually, you can. Uh, it's just going to be really difficult. Uh, and so the PowerShell script itself is not doing anything more than just moving files around. So really, we're just like uploading, downloading. It just looks like a script that a sysadmin wrote, kind of an involved script. We're uploading, downloading DLLs, and we're copying and moving. So if, you know, the, the, the thing that EDR detects on in the PowerShell liner right now is that it uses a base64 string. <laughs> So if you want to write like a one up, just don't base 64 encode the payload, really. So, okay, the the PowerShell stager in this case has no hard operating system interactions. We're not doing process injection. We're not touching LSS. Literally uploading and downloading DLLs. The back end is doing all the hard work with backdooring the DLLs with all the logic and bypassing EDR stuff. And then the stager is just sitting there and putting them where they need to go. So what are some features of this web stager? The first thing is it's C2 agnostic and that you use auth headers. So that means that when you upload your shell code, you can use whatever C2 you want, Cobalt Strike, Mythic, whatever you like. Uh, and then when you upload the shell code, it gives you this identifier, I call it a shell code prefix, and you stick it in this web GUI, and then anything you use for the one-liners or the web-friendly version if you're trying to get web shells, uh, it's just gonna inject that in there so that when it talks to the back end, it knows what files to grab. There's an off key. That means after you do your staging, you can revoke that off key, and if they try to stage your payload down again, they can't. You can create as many off keys as you want. Second cool thing, all this backdooring and DL and enumeration stuff takes like four or five minutes. You really want to know what's going on. I hate just sitting there and be like, am I going to get a shell in five minutes? Am I going to get a shell? And you don't get a shell, and you're like, gosh, I, would have, I wish I could have started something else in the meantime. So it tells you what's going on when things are uploaded and all that. And then at the end, it'll give you a done signal. It's like, hey, we uploaded the DLLs, we backdoor the DLLs, we downloaded them, we put them where they need to go. Here's the done signal, expect your shell. If you asked for an immediate reboot of the program, you're gonna get your shell immediately. If you did not, then uh, it's gonna come to you the next time the program gets naturally used. When the payload detonates for the stager, you're gonna get a bunch of information. You're gonna get information about the username, the user domain, and the IP address, the external IP address that's calling out is gonna go through a short who is, and then we're gonna be able to tell what the registrant is. So if you have something that detonates on-prem, well, and they own the IP address, it's gonna tell you, hey, it's coming from the right place. And you can go ahead and click that red link and start doing all the fun stuff. Or if it comes back and you're like, hmm, Microsoft Services, I'm just going to reject that because it's probably a sandbox. So that's one option there. The other thing is it can handle simultaneous detonation. So let's say you have 15 people that get fished and three of them click. We can handle backdooring and uploading and downloading for those three different users simultaneously. We don't have to do it one person at a time. Now when you click that red link, you get that backdoor choice. There's two boxes for all the indices that it gives you. One box is going to be the DLL you want to backdoor. The other one is the EXE associated with that DLL. So we terminate all the processes and respawn them. If you leave that empty, it just backdoors the DLLs and doesn't force reboot. If you just put in a negative one here, it's just going to grab a generic DLL that we already have, put it in, and run it with run DLL32. This is in the event that there is nothing to backdoor. You're like, I just landed on the most vanilla Windows OS. It doesn't even have bloatware. I don't know what I'm going to do, so just run DLL32. OK, so let's do a little bit of the demo here. The demo is one minute long, but the whole process takes five minutes. So I kind of jump around a bunch. The first step is to upload your shellcode file, and you give it the auth key. And you, you can revoke it right after you do that. And then when you upload it, it gives you this shellcode prefix. Okay, so let's go through this. I don't know, if can you guys see this a little bit? It's a little bright. But uh, 
This is basically what the interface looks like. You put in the shellcode prefix, and then you can select the quick option. The quick option is really handy because when you pick it and you generate an auth key, so you hit add, um, and this is going to jump around, so I'm going to have to pause, go back. Yeah, so we generate, it gives you this PowerShell one-liner that's going to use this shellcode prefix or shellcode identifier, which correlates it with the file that you just uploaded. If you s select quick, it's not going to bother giving you the options for the DLs and stuff. So let's say you're in a physical, you just want to plug in a rubber ducky, and you have quick selected when you generate your payload. It's just going to go ahead and do the whole thing from start to finish using run DLL32. Not even going to bother picking a DLL or any of that. Because we're assuming that we're the, oper the physical operator is plugging something in. We're probably not going to get like a sandbox thing calling back. But usually the sandbox thing happens if you do like email phishing. It goes through a email sandbox and then they try to execute it and all that. The other thing is if they get the payload later on after this executes and then they can look through a sandbox, you might get kind of a sandbox request. But by then, you would have already revoked the auth key, and they can't see it. So uh, sorry, let me, there's, let me go through the demo video some more here. So we select the auth key. In this case, we're going to go ahead and copy it. And then we're going to just go ahead and, and paste it over here. And we, go, uh, we hit Enter. And we look here, we get our information. And I redacted some of the, there's like, like, there's like this black box here that's just redacting information, but this is what it looks like. You have the link that you can click to go look at what DLS to backdoor, information from where your stager is calling in, and then information about the username, user domain, machine name, machine domain, et cetera, just to have, give you a more educated guess on what's going on. So in this case, we're just going to hit reject. I'm like, I don't like this. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and run it again. And I just fast forward it to where I click on that red link. And I'm going to look for Python in this case. So there's a Python 3.11 DLL. Uh, I uploaded the Python, so this jumped really fast. So what happened there is I put in the Python DLL uh, index, and I also put in the Python exe, so it force restarts Python. So what happens is the stager ran, replaced the Python DLL, it killed all the Python processes, force restart Python, and this is Python starting, taking a couple of seconds longer than usual because some funky stuff has happened in the background i.e. getting your shell, and eventually your shell calls back, and Python continues executing as normal with all the functions in the DLL. So this is where we get our program continuity. You get your long-term persistence. And this is actually from an initial access perspective, but it's the same pipeline that we use for persistence. The persistence script is in the demo video that I posted on social media as like a hype teaser video. Uh, if you're interested, check it out. It's on my profile. Um, my Twitter, my handle is primal0xf7. Uh, so feel free to go look at that video if you like. For the person, I just for the interest of time, I didn't include it. But that initial access video uses the same pipeline. So that's all I had for you, folks.